Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, conversation on uh, BQ Prime. We've got a very special guest today that we're in conversation with, Mr. Hardeep Puri, diplomat for 35 years, a minister for the last five years. Uh, the last one year, he'd been minister of oil and natural gas and housing and urban affairs, so extremely seasoned. We've seen him in a number of interviews that have gone viral recently, answering questions on why India's secure, energy security is, is its own affair and how it can't be swayed by Western public opinion. So I'm going to refer to one of those interviews. Thank you very much for joining us, first of all, on BQ Prime. I'm going to refer to the interview that he gave about two months ago in Milan, where you said, let me quote, uh, are we looking at a big R globally? And then you said, I'm, I'm worried. And you went on to say that if oil prices continued high, recovery will be difficult. Uh, what's your view on the big R? Are we still, are still, think, look, still things looking as bad as they were two months ago? And how do you view oil prices, which have surprisingly defying odds, come down since then? So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, thank you also for drawing my attention to a statement I made, you said, two months ago. And when I recall the context in which I made the statement, I feel that I was perhaps being overly generous okay. in terms of how the scenario on the big R would play out. Let me go slightly before that. I think it was in Milan that I met the head of Aramco. It was a little, it was a little earlier. I met the head of Aramco and Unlike my predecessors, I've always taken the view or the position that if you have a natural resource, it's entirely your sovereign right how you wish to market it, whether you want to keep it underground, you want to extract it, you want to market it in substantial volume or in small quantities. Because OPEC has been telling us for a long time that they don't determine prices, they merely determine the quantity of crude that they allow into the market, to which a newcomer to the portfolio like me would say, but that in turn determines prices. prices. So when I met the head of Aramco, and this is not a privileged <laughs> conversation, I said in May, I said, look, it's entirely your sovereign right, but please see what will happen in a few weeks from now. And he said, what will happen? I said, if oil prices continue to remain high and the prospect is of them continuing to remain high, then you're looking at the big R. Now, this is a conversation in May. Why am I providing that to you? Because now you're coming to a conversation in September. September. So May, June, July, August and September. I don't want to nitpick, but I think two or three things are clear. If you look at the European Union, the biggest economies there are Germany, okay, France, and the United Kingdom. I'm just giving you an example. Insofar as the United Kingdom is concerned, their new, their present Chancellor of the Exchequer has himself explicitly stated that the UK is in recession. Insofar as Germany is concerned, the facts are in the public domain. That is the case, I suspect, for much of Europe as well. We seem to have reached a recessionary environment. Look, what is a recession? Technically, it's quarter-on-quarter quarter negative growth. Yeah. Now, the U.S., in spite of having quarter-on-quarter quarter negative growth, has still bounced back because it has resilience, it has strengthened, and the monetary fund and others say there are two bright spots in the world, the U.S. and India. Okay? But there are worrisome signs elsewhere. Are we going to go into a full-blooded recession in 2023? The jury is still out. But I think I use the word, I'm worried. Okay. And I'll tell you why I'm worried. And now I'm worried. worried a little more. Okay. 
Earlier, we were talking about a recession because a fair amount of inflation had been fueled into the system on account of the very strong stimulus packages that had been saying 20 trillion dollars plus. Yep. Okay. Now, if you put 20 trillion dollars into an existing system of goods and services, obviously you have more money chasing those, so that's inflationary. Inflation, yeah. Now, on top of that, if you get high oil prices, then it becomes more uh, inflationary. And that is what leads people into recessionary. Now, I have said in the last few months, you're not facing one crisis. You are in effect facing three crises, at least three that I can see. One is a food crisis, the other is a fertilizer crisis, and the third is a oil crisis, or fuel, fuel crisis. crisis. Food, fertilizer, and fuel. <coughs> My worry is that you may be looking at this recessionary condition in spite of prices having come down. That's more worrisome. Because if prices go up, the chances of further inflation being fueled is a given. And then you will find people finding it extremely <coughs> difficult. Now, what happens in a recession? I mean, I'm taking a classical scenario is that people turn to cutting imports. If that becomes a pattern, then economies which have a large sector, large segment of their economic activity in the external sector, which means exports, services, I mean, they'll all get impacted. If you look at large sections of the world, and I don't want to be political because I think this is a technical discussion. You have, a, you have an economy of the size of $23 trillion, the United States, which is doing well. I think I'm much more positive when I look at, when I go to New York, I think it's bouncing back and it shows all signs of, you know, there also the narrative is set by what will happen in the midterm, this will happen. It's like India very much. You know, people tend to mix up yeah, political yeah. and economic issues. But I think US is looking good. You have another large economy, the People's Republic of China, what, $12 trillion? I am not clear as to what is happening there. Uh, there is clearly an economic issue involved because China's appetite for energy, it imports a fair amount, <clears throat> but at this point of time, its imports are not growing. Just imagine if China starts suddenly to revive the momentum which it had lost due to the severe lockdown policy, the uh, zero COVID, and it has other yeah. attendant problems on the uh, real estate market. There are people, you know, who have acquired properties. They are having difficulty in paying EMI, vaccine efficacy. I'm not going into that. What, what happens then? What happens to oil prices then? Okay, so you're saying this little... Uh, slowdown that we're seeing, defying all odds, could go back up yeah, again. Yeah, I am I'm, I'm just saying that if, for instance, suddenly the demand for oil in China goes up, I mean, then you will have a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of prices going up, and then you're already in a recessionary condition. So, India is an, by the way, India is an exception. Here, uh, our stock I, markets are a new high. Hmm? Our stock markets are at a new high. No, no, I mean, forget about stock markets. You don't need to look at indices in India. You just need to be present in any part of India. I have traveled extensively in Tamil Nadu, Kerala, JNK. Airports are full, aircraft are full, public transport is sink. Orders are coming in. I mean, I was looking at the uh, automobile industry. I follow that because <laughs> of my fuel uh, interest. I mean, I think either some of it is because people feel very confident and there is uh, growth, which is a very welcome sign. But in cannot be along with the United States, the only part of the world which is doing well. I mean, you need large parts of Africa, Latin America, you know, uh, Asia. China is a very large part of Asia where there are some worrying signs. So if the if you're hinging the question of I, I am worried, yeah. I continue to be worried. Okay. So what, what does all of this mean for the G7 plan to cap Russian oil prices from December the 5th. 
will have any impact or are you saying demand anyway is now impact on India yeah not, not on India and on prices in general no I think in fairness we should allow the G7 to thrash out what its proposals are I can share with you the little I know of it the proposal essentially emanates from a decision they took I think in May the Europeans Saying, saying that they were very upset with what the Russians had done and they wanted to inflict punitive action on Russia. Fair enough. <clears throat> I'm an author of a book on the use of force. Uh, I actually uh, present you with a copy. I'll, I've first, I'd written about this in the context of Libya, Syria, when India was presiding over the Security Council. If you had to take punitive action, and you're announcing it in May, why did you want to wait till December the 5th to take it? Between May, which is the 5th month, and December, which is the 12th month, is a period of 7 months. Now, you and I are analysts of the market. We study the market, but the market has inbuilt mechanisms within it where the market adjusts to new realities. So that's my first comment. Second, I've seen reporting which says that Russian oil, even when the price cap comes in on 5th December or later, Russian oil coming through the pipeline to Hungary will be exempt. Interesting. Which means it's only the, the, yeah. the, the buyer wants Russian oil. So one, they've got an exemption there. The second exemption I saw was Russian oil going to China through the pipeline will also be exempt. Third exemption I saw was because Japan is in geographical proximity to <coughs> part of Russia, to the eastern part, Sakhalin, etc., they will be exempt. Then I read some statement somewhere that smaller countries in Europe are also wanting an exemption. So I think once they've decided on what they think will be the components of this price cap and who will be covered, then we'll be able to find out whom it's aimed at, first point. Second point, I've seen a slightly differentiated approach between crude and gas. There are some people who want to be ideological and say that the Russian crude price must be so low that his punish should be about $40 or something like that. Well. Do they have the confidence that if they impose the price cap, A, that Russia will sell at $40 or below, or that Russia will not sell much higher and get away with it? So what are the implications? That if you are using European shipping and insurance, then there would be an issue. What are the implications for India? Nil. Big N-I-L. <laughs> You, you touched upon gas. No, I, I'm, I'm, can, okay. I, can I, because you know, I don't <laughs> sure. want you uh, to be reporting a statement by a minister who says nil. No, let me explain okay. that. Let me explain that. I have said repeatedly on record, when I'm saying, aren't you under pressure? A, I'm under no pressure. B, it is unlikely that I can be put under pressure. And C, I have already diversified. I used to source my imports from 27 countries. We, I'm already sourcing it from 39 countries. Russia was a marginal supplier up until 31st March 2022. They accounted for 0.2% of our total imports. I, I meaning India, India consumes 5 million barrels a day. 60%, 60 million people go to the petrol bank to fill up. Our month-on-month -month consumption is rising. Today, I have Iraq as the largest supplier. I have the Saudis, I have the Emiratis, I have Kuwait, I have Russia. Each one of us, each one of them wanting to sell more to India. So, you would be very much within your right to ask, is India playing a market card? Even if you don't ask the question, I am saying, yes, we are playing the market card. And I've been on record to say we will buy from whomever we have to. 
I was asked by a particular lady, not in that interview you're referring to, uh, by another lady, but don't you have any moral compunction? I said, my moral uh, duty is to my consumers. To feed your, yeah, I, I remember the statement. So let me just come back to, uh, but this come, brings in an interesting uh, issue. We just had the Kirith Parekar recommendations come in. I know you'll comment on it later. The minister will take a view on oil prices. I haven't even seen them, frankly. Okay. So he talks about. You guys have a you have a great <laughs> ability of getting <laughs> a recommendations of a committee before I've seen no, them. But, so but I, I believe he's handed them today. Yeah. But you know, I don't okay, see he, anything I, I, revolutionary I, 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 there. I'm not going to ask about I don't prices, know. I the prices. He, no, but he's also spoken about or recommended that you lift the price caps on gas in three to four years. No. Is that. <laughs> Uh, but how, how does that square off against the... I'll tell you, I want you to have a discussion with any of your colleagues sitting here or any group from outside. Put in trade theorists and purists in on one side and you put in practical people on the other. I started my education and trade policy in 1981. I didn't know much about economics or trade and then I spent an entire lifetime following it. One of the popular conceptions is that trade policy is based on theory of comparative advantage, this, that and the other. First lesson I learned was that if somebody becomes competitive, all the others gang up to keep that person into quotas or something. So when Japan or developing countries became competitive in textiles and clothing, they negotiated something called the multi-fiber arrangement, where exports of textiles and clothing became subject to quotas, etc. I think if I were to write an undergraduate thesis, I would say I want total pricing freedom, I want total this, which is good, I want that. But you also have to manage an economy. You also have to make sure that in the competing demands which come in the economy, like in, in gas, what are the competing demands? One is your consumer, gas, what you call <coughs> CGD, then there are the fertilizer guys, then there are the power plants, then there are others, so we are meeting that. So from what I can see, the, the committee has done good work, they must have made some sensible this thing, but I have not been through them, okay. so I don't like to comment on something. But you know, whatever it is, we are going to deal with it, we are dealing with it. And look where we have come from, we have come from a situation where we were entirely import dependent. I just freed. Uh, thanks to the Prime Minister's decisive decision-making, out of 3.5 million square kilometers of our sedimentary uh, area, we just cleared 1 million square kilometers, which is no-go area. And now the entire uh, range of big-time uh, players like Exxon, Chevron, Total, they're all back uh, acting because India is where the, you know, energy yeah. buzzes. But still, our, I mean, so gas is one story. The other story is crude oil. Our production hasn't, in fact, uh, no. is almost stagnant. How could it go up if you are not uh, you allowed to utilize your sedimentary basin? You became an independent country in 1947. In 20, up to 2021, the total amount of exploitation of your sedimentary basin was only 6%, 7%, which meant what? 0.5 million square kilometers, 0.25 million, and this brought it to 0.5. I just raised it from... 6 to 7 percent to 15 percent, and I'm going to take it up to 30 percent. But even then, there's a feeling that uh, big foreign players are a little worried. They are back. But they, they were complaining of high taxes. So are they... they were complaining of two things. One is an old mindset. And that mindset was, please come and prospect. But once you find the oil, it's my sovereign right, and I'll take over. Now we're going in the, exactly the opposite direction. Now we are telling them, we will incentivize your prospecting. And if you find it, we'll have a production sharing arrangement. It's completely changed. Two things. One is the 1 million square kilometers of sedimentary basin freed. The second is the national data repository. As a result of which, one of the big companies, I think it's Exxon, it is devoting 20% of its supercomputing time to India. So when you see they're back, but have they actually come and put their money away? Because yeah, you, they have. In, in your recent uh, they have. auction, you only had domestic players. No, no, but no, it's not like that. It's first of all, when did you make the announcement? What are, some of them have signed agreements called heads of agreement. Uh, you know, it's at a very advanced stage. Okay. And secondly, even domestic production, I was delighted the other day to find even ONGC's production has gone up. And 
Look, it's very easy to be critical. I'm not saying that before I came, things were not right. Yes, there was. If oil prices are not at 120, people feel comfortable uh, importing. I, I had the head of a major oil company who's now uh, a very eminent uh, person, commentator, who actually told me in the first meeting, why is India bothered about exploration and production? You can always access it from any number of sources. I was shocked. I was shocked. Because I personally have believed that our system, whether it is p crude oil, coal, minerals, has been gamed to allow people to sell to India. Today that has changed. That's part of a, you know, new Modi Atmanirbhar Bharat. But today in this sector, if you look at what has happened, diversification of supplies, I buy $20 billion of uh, 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 energy from the United States. Guyana has come on stream, we are buying, we are told them you want to enter into a long-term arrangement with us, please do. Apart from that, look at what we've done in biofuels, what we've done in CBG, what we are doing in green hydrogen. If you look at the totality, I think you have a paradigmatic change and shift in position. Okay. Just, just to, I mean, I was going to come to green later, but since you brought it up, green hydrogen. So you need uh, cheap electricity for one. How uh, close are we to no, that? No, you're absolutely right. You need cheap electricity and you need an electrolyzer. electrolyzer. Yeah. India is the only country in the world which has brought the cost of producing a unit from 25 cents to 3 cents. Green hydrogen is the shape of the future. Everybody who's anybody in the energy world is talking about green hydrogen. But I make one submission to you. Green hydrogen will succeed where you can produce it and consume it together. Because I think that's expenditure that will have to be incurred on storage and transportation would be mind-boggling. So it makes no sense to me for having green hydrogen made saying 7,000 kilometers away and consumed, produced 7,000 kilometers away and consumed 7,000 kilometers in the other Hell direction. What is happening just now is a very interesting phenomenon because there is great faith in the Indian entrepreneurial and innovative ecosystem on green hydrogen, lots of money is pouring into India from venture capitalists and others for the production of green hydrogen. As a result of which some people who've been quick off the mark have signed agreements to produce green ammonia in India and sell it to say a company in Germany. India, I signed an MOU with my Singaporean counterpart. The Singapore is setting up a new electricity turbine, turbine. G turbine plant, and they will be supplied green ammonia from India. But that's only the so will, will tip all, of the will, will all these issues be addressed by we all we all waiting for the integrated hydrogen policy. I mean, will all these issues be addressed there? What 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 are the contours that could take, and how all, long do you all think? I can tell you how long will it take? All I so, can tell you, it'll come sooner than uh, you expect. Okay, I am a of course an eternal optimist on this. How, I think how, it, how much coordination do you need between ministries for that? No, no, hold on. So there, there are issues involved. Okay. There are issues involved because this is not a one ministry subject. I recall in terms of sequentiality, the Prime Minister announcing from the ramparts of the Red Fort, when was it? I think 15th August 2021, that he wants green hydrogen to be pursued in mission mode. Now, there are some ministries who deal with power. Rightly so. They have a legitimate interest, etc. Then there are ministries like mine. My guys, the OMCs will tell you, well, you know, power or electricity just constitutes 17% of the energy consumed. A lot of the energy is consumed by my, my ministry. So we are an interested party. But Similarly, there are other parts of the government which are interested part. So I think the internal churning on this, etc., is now beginning to take shape. And I have absolutely no doubt that very soon, I think we will be able to put in the public domain discussions which have been held behind closed doors. So uh, let's just look at uh, fossil fuels and alternative fuels, as it's uh, called now. So there's oil and gas and coal, then the solar, wind, nuclear, hydrogen. 
how do you see this the consumption of this going forward as a as a percentage what and let me just also add you also said i think in one of the interview that you you see uh, india power demand i mean for oil demand going for 5 to 6 to 7 to 9 you said today we are a population of what 1.34 1.4 billion today average per capita consumption per capita average per capita is average per capita consumption in india is one third of global average but global consumption is growing at the rate of 1% my consumption is growing at the rate of 3% plus okay so i mean come 2040 everyone who deals with this sector that i have in mind uh, uh, bp outlook international energy agency everyone is saying that 25% of the demand which will be created by 2040 or so will come from India. Now, if 25% of global demand increase is going to come from India, surely 5 million becoming 7 million or 8 million is, is not an issue. No, it, it, I mean, the numbers the don't seem strange. Okay. So, when I said that, people said this guy is getting uh, ahead of it. No, I said 5 to 6 to waise ho jana. Because if you are now look at two things. Put aside all these oil and uh, gas and energy statistics. Today, you are a $3 trillion plus economy. Morgan Stanley says that in another four or five years, by 2026 or 27, you will be an $8 trillion economy, give or take a little. If you are consuming 5 million barrels a day at a $3 trillion economy, surely you cannot be consuming anything less than double when you are a eight trillion dollar economy okay. so Three. so i am i am saying in fact that we are a, in a sui generis position we will need lots of fossil fuels and we will need to make the transition from hydrocarbons to clean energy faster than anyone else that's why these other figures uh, biofuels uh, cbg green hydrogen become important so I mean, I think you famously said, if you have to make a transition from current fuel sources to green energy, you have to survive the present. So, but 25 years down the line, looking at energy security, what kind of uh, a pie of the energy no, thing no, do you, have, do you have, see in that? We have estimates on that. I okay. have, I, I'm glad my colleague put in. Uh, <laughs> okay. Facebook, what page is it? Yes, he's put in figures. I have the. What will our energy mix look like by that year? Yeah. BP outlook, not Indian. Okay. BP outlook in 2050, India primary energy mix will be constituted as such. Renewables 31%, oil 18%, coal 34%, natural gas 12%, and balanced by hydro and nuclear. A fundamental shift from what it is. Okay. Now. But yet, you say we have to survive the present, as you have said. So, to survive the present, how do you want? plan to increase oil production. If you accept the, the working hypothesis that all these analysis use, you must have very much enhanced domestic production, which I think we are getting okay. with the ENP changes and all these new oil companies coming. You have to acquire assets outside India also. Look. If you don't have your green hydrogen totally ready, and green hydrogen with the best will in the world will take a few years. So you have to acquire assets outside. I can't share with you what we are thinking of because that would not be correct. These are pro uh, negotiating processes underway. But I can tell you recently we put what $1.6 billion BPCL put into an ongoing facility in Brazil. We are looking at active and potential yield assets all over the world so you need to do that even as you accelerate from hydrocarbons to green energy let me say tell you why green hydrogen i think the technology is given eric can do it you must generate demand because the supply will grow automatically when there's demand but it's not the only thing you know, when oil prices went up two years ago, something very interesting happened. I looked at a figure which I happened to come across by chance. 
in the year 2021 and 21 22 4 billion dollars of funding came in from outside in the ecosystem on batteries alone and suddenly you find there's a change when i was in i was in milan i think for gas tech the new york times had a front page story on our replaceable batteries for two wheelers and three wheelers and you know we had done an analysis but the fact that new york times got to it let me explain to you we did an analysis of our surface transport i'm also urban affairs, affairs minister yeah. so i keep looking at what metros are doing etc we discovered that 70 percent of our vehicular traffic on the road comprises two wheelers and three wheelers and basically most of them or the bulk of them are now operating on replaceable batteries so what happens is if you're driving a two-wheeler or a three-wheeler and your battery charge shows low you go to the nearest bank there you have a professional system you take the battery out take another Perfect. one in they adjust the cost it's not that you have to wait there and have the battery charge some places is happening but that's all going to be passing i make a submission to you that the next round of cars which will come in this is not just two wheelers three wheelers, will all be electric vehicles electric vehicles or hybrid so the market is taking place of that okay. taking care of that so in, in, while you wait for that in the meanwhile we need to uh, wrap up production one of uh, the things that you've been keen on is the mix of ethanol and bio biofuels <laughs> to petrol so i think now between one and ten percent you had a target of 30 you brought that down to 23 achievable what are you going what are you doing to get there look let me give you a little bit of my personal anecdote on that i got posted to brazil in the year 2006 i think i was ambassador to the un in geneva i went to brazil and one of the things that i was told by my colleagues here was ke brazil ka ethanol production which is primarily from sugar cane, sugar cane. because you know Brazil has this great uh, advantage. It is, uh, it has three times our land area, one sixth our population, and 22 or 23 percent of the world's freshwater reserves. So it's very richly endowed. We had made a plan then, the then government, that they would want five percent ethanol blending in ten or so of our states and union territories. 5%. I don't want to go into the history of what happened, why we couldn't go, it's not important. But we ended that period, and in 2014, we were just using 1.4% of blending. So then came Mr. Modi. Suddenly, everything acquired a new importance. And the idea was that by the year 2022 and November, that is today's day, we were supposed to do 10% blending. And five months before that, we completed 10%. Then we took a second step that the target of 20% blending, which was at 2030, as you mentioned, we should do it by 24 or 25. We accepted the target. We, we changed the target. target. And we have to bring something called E20. E20 is a, a fuel which is 20% blended into the market, into the bunks by 1st April 2023. My colleagues in the ministry tell me they can do it even before that. So we're good on, on target. Now, to do all that, you have to develop an entire ecosystem. Now, my situation is that more people want to invest in ethanol, not just in ethanol. Now, I have a problem. Everybody says, Hamara quota bada do. Today, we, are, we have gone into second generation ethanol. I mean, in Panipat, there is an IOCL refinery which is making ethanol from agricultural waste, from Pranali. Now, if we could get this done now on a much larger scale, I think we have a target of 90 million liters of uh, ethanol second generation by, by the, today. We must check when we are reaching it. But if we can do it on a much larger scale, all this choking in winter on account of uh, stubble burning, burning, we can resolve the issue. Now, little, little steps have been taken there. But today, that Panipant refinery is actually producing second generation. There is a refinery in the northeast, which is making it from bamboo. Now, admittedly, the bulk of it is still coming from sugar. 
which again i'll be very careful over what i say i think is a situation which needs to be diversified because sugar as you know i mean sugar has a very strong support uh, group group but at the end of the day you are probably better off diversifying your feed and bringing in uh, maize uh, broken rice grain rice husk and agricultural waste and okay. that's happening okay so one uh, so you you're often or you're seen as the architect of the divestment of air india uh, now in your in your in your ministry you've got the omcs which everybody the markets are wondering when when there'll be more uh, sale but one of them one of the reasons that people may not be interested is the price cap on uh, petrol that uh, on price cap from where uh, the, the imposed by the government which or con cap? controlled the, i mean the it, me, it's, not, me, it's not open to market based me, okay let me put it's not open to market based pricing no, no, hold on hold on hold on let me share a secret which is no longer a secret there are dozens of people who want to buy bpcl if you're talking about bpcl okay what we are not going to sell bpcl just now you know when there is turbulence of this kind in the market bpcl is a very coveted entity by the way when i you since you mentioned air india i was the one person who was always said air india is a first rate asset the mistake was that we were only putting 76% of air india up for privatization no, no. now tell me you mess up the uh, functioning of an airline and then you expect somebody else to buy 76% and you remain you keep the remaining control no you're not going to get a buy which investor is going to agree so one of the first decisions we took was to put 100% on we sweetened it a bit we cut out some of their um, extravagance when I, mean, i i once went to my boss and said here 1500 crores a year expenditure has been reduced he didn't believe me i mean i don't blame him i mean anybody comes to make a claim but we were able to pull it off because it is a first rate asset i mean an airline which owns 120 planes has landing slots in uh, all over all the, the world, world yeah. which has first class engineering good safety record you just had to produce the right package Package, for it yes, to sir. go so i am very happy that in the midst of the pandemic when we were really doing controlled aviation uh, we were able to find and a good buyer, buyer. Yes. because that happened after my listing but i take great pride in being uh, associated with the process uh, at that stage bpcl is very different bpcl i think is a first rate asset bpcl if we decide to put it on the market at some stage there will be no difficulty in this thing but just now our own energy needs being what they are we will need to take a strategic decision as to when that will happen thanks for that uh, frankly and candor mr puri thank you very much for joining thank us you. it was a great thank pleasure you. thank you sir thank you.